Hey everyone, my name is Alejandro, and this talk is about JavaScript engines. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub by that handle. Uh, please note that the first O is uh, zero. And you can also find in that link all the resources and, and the slides too. The goal for the talk is to do an overview of the most important concepts used in JavaScript engines and question everything else. Before we continue, I wanted to say why I think you should care. I believe that being able to understand the optimizations that takes place in your JavaScript programs gives you a unique perspective when measuring performance. I started my path going through the history of JavaScript engines and found an inflection point around 2006. Before that time, the implementations were fairly straightforward. The engine would took the source code and parse it to an abstract syntax tree, or AST for short. An AST will omit comments, spaces, tabs, curly braces, all the things that are part of the syntax and will represent blocks and expressions as nodes in a tree structure. After that, the engine would take the AST and transform that into bytecode, which is an intermediate representation. Bytecode can be described as a well-defined set of instructions and can be considered as a portable representation since the operations will not change through the different CPU architectures. Machine code, on the other hand, is architecture specific, meaning that for the same lines of JavaScript, if machine code or native code will change through laptop CPUs to uh, mobile CPUs. The final step needed for running the program is what I call here an execution phase. And it's often described as a really big switch statement that for each instruction, it will jump to the portion of code that implements its logic. Like in mo most high level languages, JavaScript will not deal with memory explicitly. You can create objects and those objects will be allocated internally by the engine. These objects can also be in reference and in order to reuse those precious bits of memory, the system will need a garbage collector. There are different strategies to implement garbage collectors, but we will leave those details for later. Turns out, this setup, a straightforward interpreter, is considerably slow. Well, slow means implicitly comparing to the performance of a C or C++ program after all the optimizations are applied. A group of brilliant people worked on improvements over this architecture in the 70s for Fortran and in the 80s for Solve and Smalltalk runtimes. And they come up with this great idea of adaptive optimization. And we are not seeing the slides here. Let's do that. The idea of adaptive optimizations is to identify the pieces of the program that are executed too often, also known as hot functions, and to compile them during execution, hence the name just-in-time compiler or sheet compiler for short. After compilation, the engine wouldn't have any overhead for the execution of those functions, while just the interpreter with just interpreter, the functions will have to be interpreted from bytecode each time they are executed. Let me get the Wi-Fi to see if that's the issue with the slides. Yeah, there you go. So this approach is also a great opportunity to apply optimistic optimizations in dynamic languages like JavaScript. For example, collecting information about the context of a function call could open the possibilities for type specializing optimizations. In order to optimize property access in dynamic languages, inline caches, or ICs for short, were invented. Inline caches are a way to save a fast path the first time the engine access a property, it will use a slow path, but will record the steps needed to get it. 
global variables, variables from closures and prototype chains could also be optimized by inline caches. Imagine that using ICs, 100 objects lang a prototype chain could have almost the same performance that accessing a property from an object with no prototype. That's insane. And that's how big the improvement boost you could get only by using ICs. Be aware that some features of JavaScript will inhibit type specializing optimizations, like the evil function, the width operator, or try catch blocks. The basis for most engines implementations consists of an interpreter with two additional compilers. On your left, the one that optimizes compilation time, and on the right, the one that optimizes execution time. The also called optimizing compiler, and the other one, unoptimizing compiler. The unoptimized one generally creates inline caches and helps collect type information. Also, the generated code by this compiler will not use CPU registers for variables, unlike the case for the optimizing compiler. Type changes in the code could trigger the type specializing compiler to recompile, and after some case, and in some cases, after an excessive amount of type changes, it will desist and decide to penalize the code, marking it as non-optimizable. Switching to a real-world architecture, SpiderMonkey, the engine that powers Firefox, is not too far from the previous example. It will count with an interpreter and two additional compilers. It will initially transform the source code into bytecode and will execute it without compilation. After a certain amount of times the function is executed, the system will mark that function as candidate for compilation. The baseline compiler or baseline sheet will receive the bytecode of the function plus any other information the interpreter could gather, and with that, it will compile the function to machine code as fast as possible. If the number of times the function is executed passes a second threshold, the engine will mark the functions as candidate for a really, really good optimization. And that's when IOMonkey kicks in, and with the bytecode plus the type information collected, compiles the function to machine code again. Unlike the previous case, where both compilers will bail out to the interpreter, in this case, the code will bail out only to the baseline sheet. SpiderMonkey has a way to keep the internal representation of the baseline sheet up to date, even if you have type changes. ChakraCore, the engine that powers Edge, shares a similar architecture to SpiderMonkey. It has an interpreter, a non-optimizing compiler, and an optimizing compiler. The interesting part is that it can fire additional threads to compile or to run the garbage collector. Say you're running the engine in a four-core CPU. In theory, you could take advantage and parallelize JIT compilation in three of those, of those cores. Both ChakraCore and SpiderMonkey started working on their interfaces to run Node. JIT compilation is not yet enabled on Linux or OSX platforms for ChakraCore, uh, for Chakra Node, sorry, but it's on their roadmap. In the case of V8, the engine that powers Chrome and the one that uh, comes uh, by default in Node it has recently switched to a four-tiered architecture, an interpreter, and an optimizing compiler, also co called full code gen, and two optimizing compilers, Hangshaft and Turbofan. The full code gen compilers resemble the, the SpiderMonkey baseline compiler. Both will create inline caches. If V8 profiler identifies that a function is taking a good proportion of the execution time, it will then notify the engine to optimize it. Both Crankshaft and Turbofan optimize code with type information. Turbofan, it's based on a sea of node internal representation, while Crankshaft 
uses hydrogen and lithium, a high level and a low level internal representations respectively. Their idea is to eventually deprecate crankshaft and full coaching compilers and to migrate uh, its optimizations. JavaScript Core, the engine that powers Safari, has also a four-tiered architecture, an interpreter, an unoptimizing compiler, and two optimizing compilers, DFG and FTL. The low-level interpreter and the baseline compiler both uses inline caches. The engine will apply heuristics to know which level of optimization is needed, and interestingly enough, at any point, this stack can have entries of generated core code from all four tiers. You can see that uh, the FGL has a component inside uh, its LLVM, and it's an open source project that applies aggressive optimizations and have all sorts of applications outside JavaScript core. For example, in Eggman script a C to JavaScript compiler. The engine will gather type information, the bytecode, and transform that into a lower level internal representation to fit that into LLVM. They also recently uh, shipped uh, a new backend for the FTL compiler called B3 in order to keep the optimizations they wouldn't, but to reuse compilation time. Which is briefly talked about the different architectures for most advanced JavaScript engines. And now let's talk about the optimizations that they are all applying. Let's say you have a loop executing many times and inside its body a single expression of adding the variable where incremented multiplied by some arbitrary number. The reasonable performance improvement would be to make the calculations once and reference it through a temporary variable in all the iterations. All the engines mentioned here applies uh, these optimizations internally and it's called loop invariant code motion. One of the simplest performance improvements the engine could have or a JIT compiler could apply is called function inlining. Let's come back to the canonical loop and inside its body we execute a function. If the loop iterates a certain amount of time, the profiler will identify the function as hot, and if some conditions apply, it will grab the function's body and paste it directly inside the loop. Now, uh, those conditions could depend on the size of the function, the size of the generated code for that function, and so on. Now, you might be wondering why it should be faster since it's the same code. In low-level programming languages like assembly, calling a function would end up in a context switch. It will have to save all the current status, push the registers to the stack, and before returning, it will have to resume the previous context, pop the saved registers from the stack. Let's continue with the next optimization. Imagine a loop with just a sum expression, or it could be any expression you want, but if it doesn't have side effects, even like a, a signing to a variable, it could be optimized by just avoiding anything at all. And that's what the compiler would do, just remove the expression. This optimization is called death code elimination, and some compilers like the uh, hotspot JVM would even go further and delete the whole loop. We mentioned before that there are different strategies to implement garbage collection systems. Here you can see a brief comparison of all the different implementations. Generational garbage collectors will group objects by their lifespan and will assume that young objects are more likely to die than all objects. This kind of a strategy will create new objects in a nursery space and promote long-lived objects to a tenor space. Incremental garbage collectors interleave their work with the activity of, from the main program, producing shorter pauses. On the contrary, 
a stop the world strategy would halt the execution of the program until a full collection is done. GCs can also be described as precise or conservative ones. Precise GD GCs can identify all references and conservative ones look at memory patterns to find references in the heap. This last approach could potentially lead to false positives, but it's not always a problem in practice. In this link, you can find all the resources that I use while working in this presentation. If you want to read more about JIT compilers or garbage collection, and you are interested in all the details, there's a lot of material in there. You can also find me around. I'm working uh, on a way to detect on runtime which optimizations are enabled. And I had so far good results. I'm able to distinguish those engines who use hidden classes, dead code illumination, and loop invariant code motion. Hopefully, I will get to, to other optimizations too. A good question on this topic would be how do you measure performance for a JavaScript engine? And it's not an easy answer. There are a lot of benchmarks out there to test all the edge case you may find, but certainly micro benchmarks doing measurements for small operations or different loop constructs like for loop incrementing, decrementing, will not show you the whole picture. That being said, I think we should strive for maintainable and clean code. All the optimizations techniques that I came across had reasonable requirements to apply, like functions to be monomorphic. Things related to dynamic typing had nothing to do with obscure features of the language. That's all. Thank you.